I want to share with you a few moments uh, around the whole theme that runs through Scripture, that God is our rock. As I was reading through Deuteronomy 32 recently, I noticed, it's hard not to notice it, but that God in that Scripture and in that song that he dictated to Moses to give to the children of Israel, he time and time again refers to himself as the rock. He is the rock. His work is perfect. All his ways are justice. He's a God of faithfulness, without iniquity, just and upright is he. Ascribe greatness to our God, the rock. That's how the song opens. And I just put above this whole chapter the first rock song, because this is really the first rock song ever written. Not that it's heavy metal music, but that its theme in Scripture is God as being our rock. And it got me thinking, and that's where I'm bringing this message to right now, it got me thinking about the theme of, of God being our rock. What's that all about? What does it mean in Scripture? And I hadn't really heard or ever heard this preached before. I'm going to mention just some aspects of what it means to say that God is our rock. I'm going to bring out some of the teachings of Scripture for us. Firstly, to call God the rock, or to call God our rock, or to say God is my rock, brings to mind God's character, His nature, God's nature. God is rock like. He has some rockiness about him, if you put it like that. He is rock-like. How is God rock-like? How is God like a rock? Well, it seems strange to describe God like that because you could misunderstand it, couldn't you? You could say that, well, rocks are dead. Rocks are inactive. Rocks, you can speak to them if you like, but they're deaf and they don't move and they're dead. Well, that's not obviously the way the metaphor works when we say that our God is rock-like. He is the rock. He is my rock. He is our rock. Because our God isn't dead or deaf or inactive. Our God is the living God. He's the God who intervenes and who acts. He's the God who hears and answers prayer. So in what way is it correct to say that God is rock-like? Well, We've got to get into our minds the image of a huge rock, and it's sitting there. And there it is. And if you get a big enough rock, it becomes a majestic mountain. But we need to keep in mind a big rock. God is the rock. Speaks of something steady, dependable, permanent. This is how the metaphor works. Immovable. Strong constant, eternal, unchanging. These are the types of characteristics that God being our rock should evoke in our mind. He's steady. You can depend upon him. There's a permanence about God, isn't there? He's immovable. He is strong. He's constant. He's faithful. He's eternal. He's unchanging. These are the characteristics of God. You get the idea? God being rock-like. And certainly God is a rock in these ways, in his very nature. There's a rockiness to God's nature. Some theologians describe God as this. Listen to this. <clears throat> God is a spirit whose being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, truth, are infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. He is the eternal, unchanging God who always has been there, always will be there, and he never changes. Isaiah 26, in fact, in verse 4, puts it like this. Trust in the Lord always, for the Lord God is the eternal rock. That's how scripture applies the metaphor. There's an eternal unchanging rock available to us. He's God. God's character never changes. He is love. He is love 
today and he is love next year and he is love in a million years and in two million years. In fact, Hebrews 13 verse 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. His love is constant. His holiness is constant. His justice is constant. His faithfulness is constant. What he thinks about sin today, he won't have a different opinion about sin in a billion years from now. Whom he loves today, he will love in a billion years from now. He never has a bad day. He never loses his rag and gets it wrong. He never blows hot and cold and up and down and then he's never random or unstable or unsteady. You know what you get with God. You see, you know what you get with God. Everything in our lives are changing, subject to change. Even ourselves, we change, we go up and down and some days we're good and some days you get us on a bad day and even minute by minute or hour by hour, our characteristics can go up and down, can't they? Everyone is changeable, but our God is the rock. Our God is the rock and we can trust him and he is faithful and he is steady. This gives us assurance before we move into another aspect of God's rockness. God is the type of a God, you see, therefore, that you can trust, that you can build your life upon, that you can entrust your soul to, if you like. Isn't that right? God is there when you need him, through thick and through thin, he has committed himself to us. He isn't sifting sand. He isn't unstable under our feet. He's dependable, firm, faithful, rock-like. Matthew 7 and 24, if you wanted to read there, Jesus tells that famous parable about how we should build upon the rock, how we shouldn't dig and build upon sifting sand. It lets us down in the end, but we need to hear God's word and respond to God's word. And by doing that, Jesus says, we're building on the rock. God is our rock. Moving on with the metaphor slightly. The metaphor continues from what God is like or who God is, using rock imagery for that, sifting and shifting into what God offers us to say that he is our rock. Because sometimes the rock can seem to in scripture refer to actually something like a cave or a refuge or a stronghold. God is a rock as a place of escape, a place of security. A place where we can run to and find help and security and salvation from all our enemies who are hot on our heels. Psalm 18. Let me read to you Psalm 18 verse 1. I love you Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock. You see he's to be a personal rock. Who's your rock? What's your rock? What's your place? that you run to, to escape in life. You see, the Lord says, the psalmist here says, David, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock, in whom I take refuge. You see, that's the, the idea of running into him, in whom I take refuge. He's my rock, in whom I take refuge. He's my shield, he's the horn of my salvation. He's my stronghold. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised and I am saved from my enemies. That's the metaphor here. It's about a place of escape. It's about a place of refuge and running into this rock, this place of absolute, firm, safe, salvational security. In this world we can feel overwhelmed. We can feel that we're sinking. We can feel that we're going under. In fact, Psalm 40, listen to this, how it takes this metaphor again and runs with it. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction, out of the miry bog, and he set my feet upon a rock, making my steps 
secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. The idea here is, again, the rock as a place of security and salvation and firmness. Not so much in God's nature, but in what God can do for us. In this world, like I say, we can begin to feel overwhelmed. We can feel that we're weak and sink in our lives, feel hopeless. It's like we're just going down. We see other people's lives hurting, broken, sinking. Our own lives sinking in sin, sinking in failure and hurts, sinking in our own weakness, sinking in addiction, sinking in our own greed, sinking in our own selfishness that we just can't break through from, sinking in our own foolishness and with nothing to sing about anymore. That's the thing, with nothing to sing about. All hope can seem like it's lost and God, it says the psalm here, it says, God sets our feet upon a rock. God's a place where you can run into for refuge and salvation from all your enemies. He's the God who you can stand upon in time of need. God hides us, you see, in Christ. Christ is the rock that you can run into and find refuge and salvation from all your enemies. And the big enemies of the human are obviously sin. Jesus can save us from sin. Death itself. Well, Jesus is the resurrection and the life. He says, if you come to me, you'll live. If you put your trust in me, you'll live. He can save us from the enemy of sin, the enemy of death. He can save us from the enemy who is the enemy, Satan himself. On the cross, Jesus Christ defeats Satan and all his schemes against us. Jesus is the rock. You need to run into him. Like a cave can give you refuge from the storm and from the enemy, so too is Christ there to steady us up, secure us, and save us from the enemy. Give us a firm footing in life. He can put a new song in your mouth. He can change your existence. He can change your situation. He can change your present. He can change your future. Jesus is our rock, and he can make us rock-like too. And then finally, just as I finish this thought, I'm not going to obviously extensively give you everything the Bible says in this matter. It's a broad matter in Scripture. But finally, rock-like issues in the Bible and the rock metaphor can also bring us to think about God like this. In Israel, when they went into the wilderness, they found that the rock was the place to find life. They were dead. But for the rock, they were empty and dry and on the edge of death. But for the rock, in Exodus 17, we find a rock that was smitten or struck and beaten for the people, in front of the people. And that that rock was the source of life for the people. Exodus 17, listen to this. All the congregation of the people of Israel moved from the wilderness of sin by stages according to the commandment of the Lord. And they camped at Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water. And the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children? And our livestock with thirst. You brought us here, Moses. Why did you bring us here to kill us of thirst? So Moses cried to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They're almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock, there it is, on the rock at Horeb. And you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And it, the story continues there. The people drink, the people get refreshment, they get life from the rock that was struck. I find it interesting to notice that the Lord says he's going to stand 
in front of Moses as Moses lifts his hands with that staff to, to strike the rock. The Lord says, I'm going to stand in front of you. It's almost like Moses is striking through the Lord to the rock. It's almost as if the text is preaching to us, and I believe it is, that God ultimately will himself take the stripes and from himself the smitten rock will not flow water that brings life but would flow blood that brings life that brings forgiveness of sins that brings all the blessings of God to the people and all the refreshment that humans need in this life flows from the rock that was beaten for us that's Jesus Christ remember that it's by his stripes we are healed and the thirsty people in the wilderness from the rock that was beaten they got life didn't they they were going to die if they didn't drink from the rock Jesus is the rock beaten for you if you don't drink from him if you don't find life from the one who was beaten for you on the cross shed his blood you don't have life from his beating and from his cross flows not water but life flows blessing flows forgiveness there's so much more that I could share with you and I just want to close with the warning about false rocks you know if God is the rock to which we must run into and find security and find help in time of need and and all of that isn't it the case that this world offers us false rocks, false places that we should find ourselves running to in times of need, in times of emptiness, in times of guilt, in times of uh, in, uh, finding ourselves in need as humans? I mean, put it like this. We escape to the wrong places. We run to the wrong rocks. Isn't it true that sometimes we escape to drugs and alcohol when times are tough? Escapism. But we're escaping to the wrong rock. You know, drugs are not an appropriate rock to run into. There's no security or salvation ultimately in them. They promise so much they deliver nothing. It's a false rock. Some people run into pornography when they feel lonely. Some people run into the rock of social media when they feel low self-worth and they have a need to feel valued and loved and appreciated so they run to social media to try to get some validation from somewhere it's a false rock promises so much but ultimately it's futile and it delivers little or nothing nothing eternal anyway sometimes maybe when we're feeling lonely and of low self-worth we can find ourselves wrapped up in wrong relationships you know people human beings other humans can be a false rock a place where we run to for escape and there's no help in it you see Jesus is the rock we need that's what I want to say there are false rocks there are false ways through you know even re religion itself can be a place where people run to and they think they're going to find help they think they're going to find heaven they think they're going to find forgiveness in religion but it's a false rock you need the relationship with Jesus himself you need to run not to a system not to a denomination but you need to run to a person Jesus he's the rock he'll strengthen you he'll save you from your enemies he'll secure you in his love have you got low self-worth you don't need social media you need the living God he gives you purpose self-worth meaning forgiveness and life itself and we try to find a secure footing in all the wrong places and we try to find refuge and escape into all the wrong places don't people say that drugs is escapism don't people say that hobbies can be escapism even becoming a workaholic into your career to find some validation in your life that can be escapism can't it well we need to escape into the right place Jesus we need relationship with the rock and false rocks leave us empty still wounded still lost still unsatisfied still not secure still not knowing what life's all about and they're never enough false rocks are never enough and I was reminded about a song from a musical 
As I prepared this message, and the song, I think it's entitled Never Enough, but that'll do, it'll be good enough to call it that, but the lyrics of the song seem to fit in exactly with what I wanted to communicate here about these false rocks, and with this I'm finished, but listen to this. All the shine of a thousand spotlights, all the stars we steal from the night sky will never be enough, never be enough. Towers of gold are still too little. These hands could hold the world, but it'll never be enough. Never be enough. We can run to all the false rocks we can get our hands on, and they'll never be enough. Isn't that profound? Isn't it beautiful to expose this truth? Jesus is calling you to himself. False rocks never work. We need to walk to the rock, stand on the rock, and be united to the rock, and dwell in the rock of Jesus Christ. We need to run to Jesus and hide in Jesus for our salvation. Jesus Christ died on the cross in your place for all your sins because he loved you and he wants a relationship with you, but your sin would keep you from him and from the Father forever. So Jesus went to the cross to pay the penalty that you should pay. Now there's no penalty to pay because Christ has paid it all. But what he asks of you is your trust that he died and rose again for you. If you feel that you hear God's voice speaking to you that your sin's a problem, well you need to run to the rock of Jesus Christ. You need to run to Christ and say, I trust in what you've done. I trust in your finished work. I trust in your love. I trust in your cross. I trust in your resurrection. I trust in your calling me now to simply just put my faith in you and you'll set me free. You'll give me the gift of eternal life. You see, God gives us eternal life as a gift. It's not earned. We can't earn it. We don't deserve it. But God, our rock, makes us secure, brings us in and makes us safe. We can depend upon him. He's the God who's there by grace because he loves us. It's pure mercy. It's pure grace. How do we get our hands on it? It's not through religion. Religion couldn't save us. It's the bad things we've done that we need help with. It's the sins that we've committed that we need saved from. Doing good works can't work off a single sin. We need the blood of Christ. So Jesus calls us to enter into the rock and find security in him and upon him and through him. We give up the false rocks and come to the rock, Jesus Christ. Paul said, the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me.